No, it's not the no, 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 no. This is this is a few weeks after Rish Chodesh Kislev, so it's already afterwards. This is the one the Fabrengen before the so the Sedal Fabrengen. That's what we talked about. Okay. So turn Rabbanon on mitzvahs nei Chanukah Chulu beis Shama Yomrim Yomri Shemadlik Shmeinu Mikan veElach Peiches veElach beis Sil Yomrim Yomri Shemadlik Achas Mikan veElach Meis veElach. Learned to the Gemara, which we which we learned last week inside. So the sages taught Nebraisa that the mitzvah of Chanukah. So beis Shama says that on the first day you light eight candles, and then. Every subsequent day, you light less, you decrease. So the first day, you light eight, the second day, seven, the third day, six, etc. Don't we say you get my, 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 Third night, three, etc. Time of the Beis Shammai, connected party achak. What's the reason of Beis Shammai? So we remember we learned the Gemara gives actually two reasons. One is Yomim Anichnasim and Yomim Ayitzim, whether we're, we're the the candles reflect how many days are yet to come, are we still to observe on, on Hanukkah, or how many days have we actually observed? So according to Beis Shammai, it's how many days there are left of Hanukkah, eight. So therefore, you light eight on the first day. According to Beis we've only celebrated, we've only observed one day, so therefore, you only light one. That's one, one interpretation. But another, another reason given for the dispute between Beishamai and Beisilo, Beishamai says, says, that we decrease, we start with eight, and decrease that's similar to the Pariachag, the bulls that were brought in the Beishamigdash in the temple on Sukkot. And on Sukkot, they brought 70 bulls over the course of the seven-day holiday. And it started the first day, they brought 13 bulls. The second day is part of the Festival, every Yom Tev, every day has its special offering. There's a daily offering. Then Shabbos, Yom Tev, Rish Chodesh, all special occasions have special offerings. So part of the special offerings for Sukkot were 13 bulls on the first day of Sukkot, 12 on the second, 11 on the third. They would decrease till you got to seven. And a total 13 plus 12 plus 11, all the way down to seven, that's, that's, uh, that, that total 70. Okay, so that's what Beis Shammai says, that it's similar to, it's Keneged, Pareachag, it corresponds to the um, bulls that were brought on Sukkot. The time of the Beis Hillel, what's the reason of Beis Hillel, why he says we start with one and then increase, is the Maidlam HaKadosh because we increase in holiness. So that's the dispute, which, and we discussed the different, uh, we, we discussed that last week. Okay, you do add the ad Murazakein. So there's the known question of the Alter Rebbe Ma in Yinei Chanukah Lepariachag. What's the connection between Chanukah, the, can, the Chanukah lights, and the bulls of Sukkot? Especially based on what the Tzemach Tzedek says. Shagam, based Hilo Lei Pligi, Rakmish from the Ma'alam HaKadosh. The Tzemach Tzedek notes in a Maimer that, that really this dispute between Beis Shammai and Beis Hilo about how you light the Menorah, whether you start with eight and decrease or you start with one and increase, this Machleikas, and when we talk about the reasoning that Beis Shammai says it, we, it corresponds to the bulls of Sukkot, Beis Hilo says Ma'alam HaKadosh, ne- neither of them is really arguing with the other one's reasoning. In other words, everybody, the idea of Maile Makedesh is universal. Everybody agrees. It's, a, it's a, from the Gemara. The Gemara says that, that Maile Makedesh, and, um, and that's a universally held position, that you're always supposed to increase in holiness. So Beis Shammai doesn't reject the premise of Beis Hillel. It's not that Beis Shammai disagrees that we don't say Maile Makedesh. Beis Shammai also agrees. It's just that Beis Shammai says that there's precedence with Pareyachag, with the bulls of Sukkis. Beis Hillel, similarly, doesn't dispute Beis Shammai's parallel between Sukkis and Hanukkah, between the bulls of Sukkis and the Hanukkah lights, he just says that Ma'ilam HaKadosh outweighs it. So the question is, which one outweighs the other? According to Beis Shammai, the precedence is given to Pari Achag, the, the similarity to Pari Achag, to, the, to the, the bulls of Sukkis. And according to Beis Hillel, there's precedence is given to Ma'ilam HaKadosh. But even Beis Hillel would agree with Beis Shammai's connecting his link between Sukkis and Pari Achag. So in other words, excuse me, in other words, um, you can say we have to understand the connection between um, Hanukkah and the Pariachag, which is Beis Shammai's reasoning. So you can say, well, everybody knows that whenever there's a dispute between Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel, we follow Beis Hillel. And in fact, we know, everybody knows Hanukkah, nobody lights the Menorah 8, 7, 6. We light 1, 2, 3, 4. We increase because the Halacha always, the law always follows Beis Hillel. So if that's the case, what's the difference? Beis Shammai says what he says. It's Beis Shammai's opinion. <laughs> now we have to deal with it. Now we do Ma'ilam HaKadosh. So we could say, you could say that we reject Beis Shammai's premise. 
we dis- we don't agree with Beis Shammai. So therefore, he says there's a connection to Parei Chag. Whatever, we, we, we focus on something else. So you could say it's not such a compelling question. But the truth is, first of all, even were that the case, the Beis Shammai's opinion is also Torah. It's recorded in Torah. It's a part of Torah. We know that when you study Torah, you have to make a blessing before you, before you learn Torah. And what if you learn only the opinion of Beis Shammai? Do you have to make a blessing beforehand, a, a, a blessing on the Torah? Of course you do. Because even though we don't follow Beis Shammai, but Beis Shammai's opinions and his reasoning and his rationale are part of Torah. And when you study, it's part of Torah. So just because you can't dismiss Beis Shammai's link between Pari Achag and, and Hanukkah just because you say, oh, we don't follow Beis Shammai anyway, so we can dismiss it. Even if it was just Beis Shammai's opinion, we still have to understand the link according to Beis Shammai. It's still Torah. But furthermore, the Rebbe is adding, he's strengthening the question, saying, but the truth is that even Beis Hillel agrees with that link. In other words, nobody disputes Beis Shammai's connection between the Hanukkah lights and Parei Achag, which begs the question, what's the connection? How can you bring it from both? both yeah, what's the, exactly. So it's explained in many places that the, the similarity between Hanukkah and, and, and Sukkot, the, the link between them, is that they are both eight days. The mis- so what's the, so therefore what? The number eight represents higher than Ishtal Shalos. Ishtal Shalos as we've said many times over the course of our learning together. Ishtal Shalos represents all of creation, all of the created Exist, created existence. So anything from after Eirin Saif, after the infinite light of Hashem, everything that once the Ebershah starts creating, that's all part of Seyed Ishtashlis. So number eight represents higher than Ishtashlis. What does that mean? So the truth is, this is not something that's in unique to Chassidus. It actually is found in the Trivus of the Rashba. It's also found in the Kliyakar, this idea that eight is higher than the, that is like a supernatural number. There's nature rep- is represented by seven. So the Rashba brings about the Hekif and Shemira Hekif, and he talks about the different Yalim Tevim that also about the number eight, that eight is higher than the natural order. The world is created in seven days, then six days of creation, seven days Shabbos, and then there's the eighth. The eighth is, is beyond it. And uh, actually the Kliyakar, so the, the Rajba is uh, um, the 13th century. The Kliyakar is, uh, is the 1500s. So these are long before Chassidus came about. Um, the Kliyakar, in this commentary on Parsha Shemini, the beginning of Parsha Shemini, says, says, he says much stronger. He says that Kol Shiva Choyl, or something to that effect. He says that basically that the number seven is Choyl. It's like a it's like a mundane number, and Shmini is Kodesh. Eight is holy, and and we know that Shabbos Shabbos is holy. Shabbos is only the seven days. So Shabbos, while well, Shabbos is holy, but it doesn't compare to eight, which is why the, the Kliyok concludes why Bris Mila supersedes Shabbos. Why, if somebody has a child that has that has the eighth day of their birth is Shabbos, so you have a bris mila on Shabbos because the eighth day is hot, the eighth day mila, which is connected to eight, is higher than the holiness of the seven, which is Shabbos. I mean, the point is that we see that seven represents nature in the natural order, hishtal and eight represents higher than hishtal So it's not just that the number symbolizes creation and beyond creation, but also it represents different energies of holiness. That seven represents, just like the idea of creation, is def- the definition of creation is that it's defined, it's limited. Creation means it has, it has parameters, it has dimensions, it has borders. So creation, in its very, by its very definition, is defined. It, it has parameters, it's limited. And so therefore the light of godliness that's that present in creation is a limited light. Right? Like, but the light that's beyond creation, that's a transcendent light, that's limitless, that's infinite. So seven is a number that's related with finite, and eight is the number of infinity, as the song goes. We can't do compare to light. I'm sorry? We can't compare to light. You can't compare what to light? Transcendency, because we, we right now have the wrong light. We have right now the wrong light. We have limited. What we have is limited light. So but we, we're we, saying seven and eight are two different things. Seven is related to the natural order. Eight represents beyond, beyond, limitless or infinite. So we see that Sukkot and Hanukkah are both eight days. So that's a connection. So the Rebbe says, but but um, but this itself also requires explanation. So great, we see a link, a connection. But still, Mahu Hakesher the Sukkot of Hanukkah What's the connection between Hanukkah and Sukkot, each separately and both, and, and, and then? as we could connect them together to each other, what's the connection with these with higher than Ishtal Shlus? Which is why there's eight days. So, you know, the, um, you, know you could say that, that Hanukkah is eight days because the miracle is eight days. Right? So besides the fact you have really a, a whole question about 
the eight days of Hanukkah, whether, whether the miracle actually lasted eight days is the famous question. We'll touch on probably a little later as well. But the point is that if, if it's eight days, it means that it's connected to eight. So the question is, what is that connection? It's not just that. Because it's eight days, therefore we, we link it to eight. There's an intrinsic connection between the concept of eight, which is a transcendent, infinite level, with Hanukkah. They both have the same properties, same characteristics, which is why Hanukkah is eight. So we have to understand the connection between Sukkot and and Hanukkah with the concept of eight, with higher than Ishtalshans. The Gam, furthermore, the, the Hanukkah Menorah was established, the lighting of the Menorah was established uh, uh, similar to the candles that were in the base of Migdash. Because the miracle, we light the Menorah because of the miracle that happened with the Menorah in the base of Migdash that they had. We learned the Gemara last week. They found the, the oil and they lit the Menorah, and the oil miraculously burned for eight days. Which oil? The oil of the Menorah, the Menorah that was lit in the base of Migdash. One of the services in the base of Migdash was a, a daily lighting of the Menorah, the candelabra that was in the base of Migdash. And so, represent or, or, or symbolic of that miracle, in commemoration of that miracle that occurred with the Menorah in the base of Migdash, we have our Menorah, our Hanukkah lights. So in the base of the Mikdash, the Menorah had seven branches. Why is that in Hanukkah we have eight candles and eight days? So again, we said eight because the miracle is eight days, but still, the idea is that we're, it's corresponding to the miracle of the Menorah. So if it's corresponding to the miracle of the Menorah, the Menorah in the base of Mikdash had seven candles. Why does ours have eight candles in eight days? The, this, the comparison between Hanukkah and Sukkot is not in general the holiday of Hanukkah and the holiday of Sukkot, but it's the, the Menorah, the lighting of the Menorah, the Hanukkah lights, with specifically the bulls of Sukkot that were offered on Sukkot. The is Hanukkah, Sheikham la Menorah. As we just said, Hanukkah, the, the, specifically the Menorah on Hanukkah, is co- corresponds to the Menorah of the Beis Hamidosh. Neir is Hanukkah, he mipnei anesh rei b'neir is Menorah. Right, the miracle of the, the Hanukkah lights are the, uh, commemorate the miracle that happened with the with the candles of the Menorah, the fire in the Menorah. But the bulls that were brought on Sukkot were offered just as all the other sacrifices were on the altar on the mizbeach. The menorah in the base of Mikdash and the altar in the base of Mikdash were two separate vessels, two separate um, um, vessels in the base of Mikdash. Especially in light of what's discussed in Kabbalah and in Chassidus, that we, the difference between the, the function of these different vessels, that each one has its own unique role and function. The shen is furthermore, not only is the, the, the actual vessel and its shape and its, and, and, and its usage, Different, but the, the, the services are different services. To the extent that the neiris, the menorah, the candelabra, was a greater service, a higher service than the base of than the service of the karbanis. The, 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 when the Nisim, the princes, inaugurated the, the tabernacle in the desert, so each tribe, the princes of each tribe, brought sacrifices for, so for the first 12 days. Each one of the tribes brought uh, sacrifices, and it says that Aaron, the only tribe that didn't, so it's twelve, which is Menashe and Ephraim. The one tribe that didn't was the tribe of Levi, Aaron's tribe. Aaron, the high, high priest, when he saw all the princes bringing the the the, the, the sacrifices, so he felt bad. Says Chol Shaddai Aaron was it felt bad that why is he missing out on the action? So God reassures him and says, No, don't worry about it. Your, your role, your function is greater than theirs. Your role is greater than theirs because you're going to be the one who's going to light the Menorah. And to the point that the, that the Menorah is not going to ever uh, cease. The, the lights of the Menorah will never, it will never cease. The Eina B'Tayl Islaylam, which is a reference, I think the Ramban says, to, the, to Hanukkah. Because now, after the base of Mikdash was destroyed, so we don't, we can't offer sacrifices. So sacrifices haven't been brought for two thousand years. But the menorah, in some way, shape, or form, is still being lit. We still light the menorah. We have the Hanukkah lights. So we see that when God reassures Aaron, He was saying that your service, the menorah, is even greater than the sacrifices. So, so first of all, how do we compare the Hanukkah menorah to? Specific, if you want to compare the holidays, Hanukkah and Sukkot, we still have to understand that. What's the connection with eight? That was one question. 
But the question is even stronger because we're not even comparing it to Sukkot. We're comparing specifically the Menorah, the Hanukkah Menorah, with the sacrifices. And how do you make that connection when one is brought on the altar, one is a Menorah, there are two different services in the Beis HaMik, there's different roles, to the extent that even that Hanukkah is actually, or the, the, the Menorah, the service of lighting the Menorah was a greater service, a higher service, whatever that means, higher than the service of the sacrifices in the Temple. So how do we link the two of them? The Gam Tzarek Lov, and we also have to understand, Masha Mitzvah, Sashal Nair Chanukah, He Meshetishka Achama. The Gemara there also says that, that when do you light the Menorah? When is the obligation to light the Menorah? Meshetishka Achama, by sunset, when the sun sets. Do you do Adiyuk Vazer? So the question is... Sorry? No, Chanukah Menorah. When did they light the menorah in the Beis Hamikdash? The menorah was lit every single day, not just Hanukkah. Beis Hamikdash lit the menorah every day. When was that lit? From Plaga Mincha. What's Plaga Mincha? Which is Show Revia Kaidemashkia. That's an hour and a quarter before sunset. The Kivit Shneir is Hanukkah Im Kanal. The Pnei Anes Shahoya Beneris Hamikdash. And since the 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 Hanukkah lights that we light, our menorah. Is is in commemoration of the base Amig- the menorah in the base Amigdash, or Bifratcha called the thing that came there. I said, especially if you consider the fact that everything that the sages uh, is instituted, they modeled after a biblical counterpart. So then, it would be appropriate that the menorah should be lit at the same time as when you would light the menorah in the base Amigdash. So why is it that the menorah is lit dafka specifically when? Um, when it's when it's nightfall. So again, just to, to, to finish this off over here, this idea of, of plaga mincha the Rebbe helps us out. What's plaga mincha? So we know that in the, in the Jewish calendar, everything revolves around time, specific times for everything. So the day is divided into twelve hours, twelve daylight hours, twelve uh, nighttime hours, and because that's it's not exactly you can't divide daylight and, and nighttime exactly into twelve. So the hours are proportional hours, meaning they, they shift, they adjust. They can be up to over 70 minutes to less than 50 minutes, you know, to 50-something minutes. They, they shift because we divide the, the, from sunrise to sunset by 12. So plaga mincha, so you have mincha, mincha g'dayla, you can daven mincha g'dayla, you can start davening six and a half hours into the day after sunrise. So half an hour after, after noon, and noon is not 12, but it's six hours into the day, it's the middle of the day. Half an hour later, you can start davening mincha. Mincha Tana is appropriately, uh, the, the, the time for mincha, the smaller mincha is two and a half hours before night, before sundown. Plaga mincha is half of that time. is half of the mincha Tana, which is two and a half hours before sundown. So that would leave an hour and a quarter. So an hour and a quarter before sunset, that's Plaga Mincha. When was the menorah lit? The menorah in the base of English was lit at Plaga Mincha. Why? Because the Rebbe says here, note, look at note 11. The last thing that was done in the temple, the last service on the base on the altar, was the bringing of the afternoon oila, the daily sacrifice that was in the afternoon. After that, they offered the incense, and that was finished by a qu- an hour and a quarter um, before sundown. The menorah was lit. We say it in, in uh, morning prayers. Was lit after the offering of the incense. So that was done afterwards, which was done right at that time of Plaga Mincha. So we see that the Menorah was at so Plaga Mincha, an hour and a quarter before sunset, sunset obviously it's still light outside. It's not dark yet, it's, it's, not, it's before sunset. But the Menorah, the Hanukkah Menorah, when do we light the Hanukkah Menorah? We light it Mitzvah Sameshetishka Achama. When is the appropriate time to light it is when the sun goes down. So that's the question. Why? Especially in considering the fact that if the Chachamim are establishing lighting the Menorah. In, in commemoration of the Menorah in the Beis Hamikdash, so everything the Chacham instituted, they modeled the parameters of it, the rules and regulations of whatever it is they instituted, after its 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 biblical sort of counterpart. It's modeled after something biblical. So, so if there's the biblical command to light the Menorah, so it would follow that if the Chacham are instituting to light the Menorah because the Hanukkah lights are a rabbinic institution, then it should be modeled after it, just as the Menorah in the Beis Hamikdash was lit, plaga mincha. So same as now, Hanukkah should be the same time, and yet it's not. Okay. Chapter 2. That's the question. That's the question. So we have a number of questions. One question is, what's the connection between um, um, Sukkot and, and Hanukkah? And specifically, the Menorah with Pare Achag. And especially if you consider the fact that they're two separate, they're two separate uh, um, um, services in the basement. There's two separate functions. They've co- accomplished two separate, th- two different things. So how do we link them together? The idea that they're, the idea, right, so why, why are we linking them? The idea that it's eight also requires explanation. What does it mean that it's eight? Why is Hanukkah eight days? Why is it eight lights? 
Why is it eight lights, not seven? So that we have to get into that. And also, why isn't it Hanukkah? The mitzvah is to light the mirror after it's dark. Okay, base chapter two. So the 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 answer is as follows: The purpose of or the function of the candles of the menorah of the Hanukkah lights is to illuminate the darkness. So you have light. So we light the menorah. So that's light. You're you're bringing light into the world, right? Every time you light a candle, you're bringing light. So there are two types of light. There's light. There's regular light, light that you can have during the day. And then there's light that is, that is specifically to illuminate darkness. The light that it takes to illuminate darkness is a much stronger light. It's a much more intense light than the light that you, need, that you need during the day. You need a much stronger light to illuminate darkness. Meaning, if you say that there's a light to illuminate darkness, it means that there's a light that is not strong enough to illuminate darkness. Right? So when we say that the purpose of the Neiris Hanukkah, the Hanukkah lights, is to illuminate the darkness, we're talking already about a whole different light. Tehine. Right, but you need a stronger, a more powerful light to illum- to to light up the darkness. And the dark, the stronger the darkness, the stronger the light that you need to light it up. The idea, what you're saying is a small candle. Ma'at It's a different thing. It's not to, to, to be confused there. Yes, a little bit of light can dispel a lot of darkness. It's disproportionate, but you still need a strong light to illuminate the darkness. If it's lighting up the darkness, it, it shows that it's an intense light. The whole miracle of Hanukkah occurs. What, what is it? We, we learned the Gemara says, "My Hanukkah, what's Hanukkah?" And it goes on to discuss what happened after the battle was 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 won, and they go back into the temple, they rededicate the temple, and they're looking for oil to light the menorah. So, what happens when they went in? So, it says that when the when the Greeks had been in control, they had come into the Beis Hamikdash and they had ransacked the place and they had desecrated, they had defiled the temple, and Timu they defiled all the oil in the in the in the this, the, the, the darkness that was wrought by the Greeks was so great that it's not only that they defiled the temple and the sanctuary, which is a holy spot in the temple, but that they also defiled the oil that was in the base of English. The Shemen who begin as Kaidish. What does this mean? What is the significance of that? Not only did they defile, because, because it says. The, the, the Gemara is emphasizing that you know what was so egregious, what was so terrible about what the Greeks did. The worst, the worst part of it, not only that they came into the temple and ransacked it and defiled it, but they managed even to defile the oil. What does that mean, even to defile the oil? So he says, the Shemen of Bechinas Kaidish, because oil is Kaidish, holy. Because of Shemen Mishchas Kaidish, like the verse says that the oil is a holy anointing, an anointing, holy anointing oil. Kaidish Mila Begarme. So it says in Kabbalah that Kaidish, the word Kaidish, which holy is holy, is a Mila Begarme. It's, it's a noun. The Dugma says Shemen Shetzof Al Gabi Kolam Ashkin. The Einim Isayim Mom, similar to oil that floats above other liquids and doesn't mix with them. So there's there's Kaidish and there's Kadish. What's the difference between the word Kadesh and the word Kadesh? Kadesh is an adjective. You say something is, something is holy to something else, or something else is holy. Kadesh Hayyim, the day is holy. So when you say that something is holy, so that's how holiness mixes with something else. Take something else and, 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 and sanctifies it, makes it holy. So that's Kadesh. Kadesh is an adjective. It's something that describes something else. Kadesh is a mila begarme. That's that's a down. That, that's 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 an inherent disposition or an inherent uh, um, state of holiness. What's holiness? Holiness, by its definition, is separate. Something that's separate. So holy, in its own right, doesn't mix with anything else. And why is oil called holy? Or why is oil a, a, a symbol of holiness of kodesh mila begarme? Because just as liquids, you mix liquids, they all mix together. Liquids mix together very easily. Allah, except oil, not only oil, but but oil has the property that oil doesn't doesn't mix anything else. Oil, you mix it with any other liquid, the oil will always rise to the top. So oil remains separate. So that's why oil is a, is used as a metaphor for holiness or symbolic of holiness. But what type of holiness? Not kodesh. I'm sorry, yeah, right? Yes. Not kodesh. I'm sorry, um, kodesh. Not not kodesh, but kodesh. 
right? Milo begarme. That's that's what oil represents. So oil represents a level of of of, of, high, of greater holiness, not the lower level of holiness. It also it says that kodesh. What's the difference between kodesh and kodesh? The word kodesh is typically spelled with a vav. Kuf dalad vav shin. Vav represents hamshacha, drawing down. The way you actually draw the letter vav, start from the top and you go down. That's the proper way to draw vav. So vav represents a drawing from above to below. So it's the way something comes from higher to connect to something lower. That's kodesh. Kodesh, the word kodesh typically here it's spelled with a vav because we don't have vowels, but it's, it's just easier. But, but kodesh is typically spelled without a vav, meaning no drawing. It's, it's aloof. It's separate. It's distant. So oil represents a higher level of holiness, a very high level of holiness, where holiness is totally separate from other things. And it's that holiness that was defiled by the Greeks. The Mizem move on. From this is understood, the fact that they were able to defile all the oil in the temple. So the fact that, they, this is why the Gemara emphasizes this, this crime of defiling the oil, specifically. Because even though the temple itself, the heichel itself is high, the oil, we don't find that the oil that was used for the, for, the, for the service of lighting the menorah, we don't find that it had any type of inherent holiness. It had to be pure, sure. It had to be, it had to be, had to be kosher. But we don't find that it had inherent holiness in it, unlike the, the temple itself, which had holiness. After Kedushas HaHechel, he dug in Nihilus Bas Kedushas, even though the, the Hechel, the sanctuary itself, which is where the menorah was, which is where they, they entered, where the Gemara says, where they found the oil, the Hechel itself is holy. In fact, the Mishnah says that there are ten levels of holiness. So it starts with, um, with walled cities in Eretz Yisrael, then the walled city of Jerusalem, and then in a temple mount, until uh, you get up to the Holy of Holies, the holiest spot, the holiest, the highest of all ten levels of holiness is the Holy of Holies. The Kodesh HaKadoshim. One step before that is the Kodesh, the sanctuary, the, 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 the Heichel, the room that was in front of the Kodesh HaKadoshim. That, we don't find that oil is higher up on that chain. And yet, the fact that they defiled the Heichel, the one thing, we, we don't even address that. But what are we talking about that they defiled the oil? How are we doing on time? We have a few minutes? Okay. So we're not going to time to finish this whole thought here. We'll continue it already next week, uh, next class. But the point is like this. That just to finish this point, that, that, the, that we're talking about the oil, which represents holiness, Kodesh Mila Begarmei, a higher level of holiness, which is why the Gemara talks about specifically the defiling of the oil, even though it was in the Hechel. And even though they, the Hechel is a higher level of holiness, but oil is symbolic of a higher level, which we have to understand. What does that mean? What is it symbolic of? What does it symbolize in the higher level of holiness? We still have to elaborate on that. But the point is we see that oil represents a high level, which is why even after they purified the temple, Tiru Migdashecha, and they came and they, they, they repaired the base of Migdash and they, they restored order. Still, they requi- it required an, a special miracle for them to even find this holy oil. Meaning, it was a much, it was a, a greater miracle, the miracle that we're talking about, the specific miracle, the significant miracle was the one of the, of, of specifically of the oil. So we have to understand what that means. And we'll continue that, Mr. Shem, um, next class, I think. Right.